Absolutely no problem. Our arrangements have always worked flawlessly. You, you... Yes, come in. Sorry, that's all right. Excuse me. Yes. We can't find Dick B. Mm. No one else knows this chap. Could be a journalist. Mm. Better get rid of him. I'm so sorry. I assure you there'll be absolutely no problem. You have my personal guarantee on this. Good evening. Our studio discussion tonight features the back of the past things. Adam, how do I find the cord? I don't know. I never use it. Snob. The quickest starting. Hurry, hurry, hurry. It's, um... I was told that this was a civilised place. It is, Mr. Seaton, for those who behave in a civilised manner. Just tell him where you want to go, will you? King's Cross. Then stop at the post box, please. I think he looks very distinguished, don't you, Sylvia? Oliver always looks distinguished. What must be remembered is that actors are at least as paranoid as actresses, or women actors, as Miss Brackling prefers to call them, in an age when employment of any kind is precarious in the extreme. Oh, it's so unfair. Skill is getting recognition. Not the sort of preferential treatment Miss Brackling seems to be demanding, 
And one is bound to like your purchase to be public as treasure. Well, I wouldn't appear on a program like this. When considering her tiresomely naive heroine. drink too much, Justin. You know it brings on your asthma. Oh, Sylvia, I finished dictating chapter 12 today. I'm sorry, Celia. I'm expecting a new chunk from Morris. Well, what is it this time? White slavery in Westminster. Mercenaries in Mayfair. Something to do with money laundering. What on earth? Will you two please keep quiet? Views of theatre critic Oliver Latham. Anna Bradley's novel about backstage mayhem is out next Thursday. Good night and good reading. Idiot has destroyed so many careers. Well, who got Anna Bradley on the programme? Our publicity department thought it'd be a good idea. Exactly. Well, it's good, usually. So, any publicity is good publicity? We have to do what we can. Well, thank God I didn't write for a living. Exactly. I must go home. Why? I promised to call New York. Oh, phone from here. It might be a long call. So they're still after you, are they? Yes. And I'm still thinking about it. Dick B. Seaton? Uh huh. I don't want to see prepared. Oh, I'm being fired. <laughs> the Swiss or the Germans might have enough to move on, but I'm not sure we do. We did agree Thursday with them, so if we go later, Luca will have honored everything. Well, 17 million in Japanese yen. Well, we don't yet know how much of that he's handling, sir. <sighs> exactly. And if we muck it up, we'll have the Home Office down on us like a ton of bricks for ruining relations with Japan and threatening 25% of the workforce. If we aren't ready now, we never will be. OK, day after tomorrow. I hope we're right. you last night. I had Justin and Sylvia over. Oh, my God, what a waste of time. Justin thought you were very cruel. But I think there's enough bad writing about without encouraging a woman like that. Celia, you encourage Morris. I'm very fond of Morris. You know he has a way with women. Where is he? Still in town, digging dirt. We're expecting him down for the weekend. Oh, my God.
Wait. Yesterday in Ipswich. Bag these and send them to forensic. Oh, hello, Sylvia. Uh, hello. He works you even harder when he's away, doesn't he? I don't mind. Oh, does this mean that you've finished all he sent you? Because if so, perhaps you could make a start on the typing I left on Tuesday. I've still plenty to do for Morris. And anyway, he should be home soon. It's a simple enough method of laundering. It's all been done before. Yes, well, we'll need the couriers if we're going to make it stick. What about those hands? Anything yet? I haven't got very far yet. No rings. The finger pops were burned away. Posted nip switch? Yeah. I'll get a decent print. Mm. Mr. Williams. Interview with Mr. L. J. Luca, Thursday, August the 6th at 11.20 a.m. In the presence of his lawyer, Mr. R.T. Williams. Interviewing officers, Commander Dalgleish and Superintendent Maitland. You do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so, but what you say may be given in evidence. The credit limits you give your members, Mr. Luca. How do you decide on them? Personal decision. Oh, I see. You, you know them all personally, then? Well, I know their credit ratings, yes, of course. I, otherwise, I'd go out of business, you see. Now, tell me, uh, what about this Mr. Kagawa? He describes himself as a commercial traveller. I mean, is it usual to give a commercial traveller a credit rating of £50,000? Especially one who only took out a temporary membership last Monday. Now, Mr. Kagawa uh, was... Uh, recommended to me personally by people that I know and uh, I trust. His credentials were impeccable. Oh, I see. You know who he's employed by. Frankly, I'm, I'm more interested in my clients' ability to pay their debts. Other aspects of their lives, are, they're irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. Even if they're employed by known criminals? Commander. Some of my most distinguished guests who include, as I'm sure you're aware, members of the Cabinet have kept have kept, or in fact keep, dubious company. That's really, it's not my business to go uh, too deeply into such matters. And you're perfectly happy to handle money that may be illegally acquired. Do you have evidence? Your books show no checks from Mr. Kagawa. Mr. Seaton. 
Did he? No, Morris Seaton. He took out membership at the same time as Mr. Kagawa, and yet his credit limit is only five hundred pounds. Well, you know, I don't know every casual visitor. Yes, well, he was signed in by someone in your staff, a Mr. Digby Seaton. Uh, they're related. Ah, uh, yes, Digby's brother. Yes, had to get rid of Digby. His drinking was uh, getting to be troublesome. His brother was asked uh, asked not to return. He was trying to take photographs of our clients. Do you know why? Well, he claimed it was research, but you know, our, our client's privacy it has to be preserved. We put him in a taxi. I believe he was pursuing his investigations amongst the horrors of King's Cross. Anyway, what's this got to do? Mr. Luca, we know all about it. Your club is filled with couriers acting as players who get credit limits well above normal. They deliberately lose and pay you in illegally exported yen. Oh, really? Look, I know nothing about it. And I suppose you know nothing about those? Oh. No, I don't. I don't. Do you know who sent them to? No, I don't. A what? No. An informer? Somebody with a bad debt? Or were they perhaps meant to frighten you? A contract? Hey, do I have to put up with this crap? decision. Well, why are you taking so long? I mean, what's the problem? You, you don't seem to want to talk about it. But, uh, of course I want to talk about it. Oh, well, how about tonight? Then why did you come round the flat? Oh, I can't. Not tonight. It's impossible. You should see my desk. The weekend, then? Have you got the time? Look, I'll make the time. Okay. Fine, if you can manage it. Saturday's the best for me. I'll call tomorrow. We'll fix up something. Yeah, all right. That'll be good. Wonderful. See you soon. Ah, there you are. You haven't been jogging, have you, Justin? It's terribly bad for you. I've just seen telephone the police. What are you talking about? A boat with what looked like a body. I had an idea like that. I gave it to Morris as the start of a book. The corpse without hands lay in the bottom of a small sailing dinghy floating just within sight of the Suffolk coast. found the owner of those hands in Suffolk. Just come up on the computer. There's a CPA printout. Morris Seaton. Now, wasn't he the man who was thrown out of Lucas? Yes, that's right. Thrown out of the pool door for taking photographs. Morris Seaton. I'm going up there. This may be the link we need. But it's a Suffolk case. They won't take carnage to you. Just it out. Refer up and across. Tell them it's a favour. You better get those hands up there by dispatch. I'd like the pathologist to see him before I get up there. Good luck. I'll be back tomorrow. But, Adam, surely you knew he was one of our clients. Yes, I did. But, uh, look, I'm sorry about tomorrow. No, oh, never mind. It's all right. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, ring me when you know what's going on. OK, goodbye. I spent the entire afternoon saying nice things about Paul Morris Seaton. I had to cancel my lunch at the Garrick. All right. Yeah, fine, absolutely fine. What's the matter? Adam has gone down to Southwold to see about Morris Seaton. Really? Have we still got stock of his last title? Oh, we remained at it. Mm. To think he should get all the publicity he could ever want only by dying in such a macabre fashion. Do you think it's worth a reprint? But hardly. Yeah, by the time we get it into the shops, they'll have moved on to something else. Oh, let me show you this. Seaton wanted to endow a literary prize. Yes, he was proposing to give an enormous sum of money. Wouldn't have left much for his heirs. Yeah, perhaps you're right. Hmm. I 
afraid I'm going to disappoint you, Commander. Oh? Yeah, there's no doubt about the cause of death. Really? Coronary occlusion. Due to a blockage of an already narrowed left anterior descending coronary artery. A heart attack? There are some injuries, but in my judgment, they occurred after death. Probably getting him in or out of the boat or banging his head when he collapsed. It looks to me as if he just keeled over some hours after his last meal. What about the hands? Oh, they probably belong to the body. Probably. Chopped off some hours after death. No question of him bleeding to death. Do you know what was used to burn the flesh off? Probably a strong acid. But then they were washed and dunked in formaldehyde. Someone like Luca could launder 17 million pounds, but apparently he can. Of course, the last thing I want to do is get in your way. No, no, you're welcome to see him. Don't forget I've had dealings with Luca before. The master turned round and accused me of fabricating evidence. The chief's delighted to let you take charge. Hmm. Inspector Reckless, Sir? Commander Dalglish. Commander, how do you do? Jerry knows Seaton's neck of the woods like the back of his hand. Leave you to it then. Let me know how you get on. Thank you. The pathologist wouldn't commit himself, but it's it's got to be a cleaver, acts of some sort. Yeah, something fairly blunt. How long has Seaton lived up here? About 20 years. He had a lot of incomers then when prices were cheap. Literary types, mostly. And would you say he was part of the community? Well, you know how it is. Only takes a quarter of a century before you're accepted around here. If you are. Well, it's a bit late now. We'll take statements in the morning. Do you want me to set up an incident room? Well, it's not necessary, is it? Well, you haven't come all this way for natural causes, have you? And they'll want to show off their hardware, won't they? Seeing as how it's the yard. I was told to be civil to you. Yeah, I have been so far. Well, that only takes about ten years. The peaceful village of Monksmere, home of the writer Morris Seaton, is shattered by this morning's discovery of his mangled body. Celia Calthrop, the well-known romantic novelist, was a close friend of his. Morris Seaton was a man without enemies. He was one of the first to discover this lovely place. And several of us, myself, the historian Justin Bryce, and Oliver Latham, the theatre critic, we drifted here separately when prices were low and formed by pure happenstance a little literary community. Morris was a pillar of that community and he will be missed and mourned by everyone who knew him. Celia Calthrop on her fellow writer Morris Seaton, whose mysterious death is the subject of a high-level police investigation. In Norwich today, it was learned that the famous covered market is to be closed for... Sir Seaton's secretary, Sylvia Cage. Been with him for years. Ever since the accident. She claimed she was driving Morris Seaton, but the investigating officer thought it was the other way about. Wouldn't press charges, though. When was this? Oh, it was six, seven years ago. Right, well, we want statements from everyone who knew him. Did he have any enemies? Uh, did they notice anything or anyone suspicious? That sort of thing. Oh, and I want everything you've got on Oliver Latham. Find out if he's still up here. If he's not, I'll see him in London when we get back. Right. 
Let's go and see Miss Cage. I've got some good news. What? I'm going to be a millionaire. And I'm getting a double first. Great. Let's get pissed. When did Mr. Seaton's notes arrive? Thursday. Three days after he died. Here's the envelope addressed by Mr. Seaton to himself, as usual. It also contained a roll of film which I sent to be developed. It won't be back before Monday, I'm afraid. Do you have a receipt, Miss Kidge? I'm afraid not. It's a specialist firm near St. Albans which handles film for miniature cameras and I simply popped it in the post to them. Why didn't he address this to you? I'm merely his secretary. Was. I was very happy working for Mr. Seaton, Commander. If I hadn't been, I would have hardly carried on after my accident, would I? Are you sure Mr. Seaton type these? Well, it looks exactly like his old portable. He was so... old-fashioned somehow. Can I get you something? Description of Lucas Club hmm? and a handless corpse. Look at the postmark. Posted after he died. I'm sorry. Hmm? Uh, Miss Kidge, these um, descriptions. Uh... Mr. Seaton always sent home a copy of his background notes in case they got lost. He was, as you can see, very methodical. Why do you think he included a description of the handless corpse? I can't answer that, Commander. Why well, do you think it was something to do with his book and the plot? All I can tell you is that the idea came from Celia Calthrop. I remember typing it out. Though why he should have included it in these notes, I can't imagine. Calthrop? Yes. And who are you? I'm sorry, Commander Dalgleish. Oh, yes. The man from the yard. I hope I'm not interrupting, but may we talk? Well, if you don't mind waiting a few moments while I finish these, uh, then we can go to my house. It's very near here. Yes, of course. I find this church very restful, don't you? One thing you have to say about Morris, he was punctilious when it came to research. What he did with it, of course, was a different matter. I wouldn't say anything to you, I didn't say it to his face, but I often thought his books lacked, shall we say, the smell of life. The great bulk of readers don't notice, of course. Though I have to say, the letters I get from my public, is that enough milk? Uh, yes, thank you. Did he talk to you about his new book? Well, I suppose if he talked to anyone, it was to me. Of course, I'm just the opposite. I never say a word to anyone until I'm completely satisfied with the first draft. It's almost a superstition of mine. Miss Kelsop, and just is the watching? same. Though, of course, he's a Byzantine historian. Oh, Elizabeth, darling, this is Commander Dalgleish investigating poor Morris's death. How do you do? 
And you know Digby, presumably, Morris's half-brother? Haven't had the pleasure. But Pettigrew's told me all about you. Morris's solicitor. He knows everything. Digby, it's not even lunch time. I know, Celia, but Morris has just left me one and a half million quid. Provided you marry. Hmm. Oh, I don't think that'll be a problem, do you? Well, I think Morris was a mean old bugger. Elizabeth, is that what they teach you at Cambridge? Oh. He treated Sylvia like a slave. Well, only because she allowed him to. I often spoke to her about it. Quite right, Celia. Sylvia let herself be treated like a doormat. Gave me the creeps. And Morris broke her back. Since she was driving the car, dear. You know she only said that to save Morris, and all he leaves her is a couple of grand. How do you know? Ask Digby. Oh, you're all right. He's left you ten. And guess who gets the rest? Unless he fails to find someone foolish enough to marry him. In which case, Aunt Celia, it all goes to you. Seaton died last Monday night, or on a Tuesday morning. How do you work that out? No, he was last seen in London at around 11 o'clock by Luca. The pathologists reckon he died a few hours after his last meal, which means he was brought up here on the Tuesday. Why? Mm. Well, his hands were posted from Ipswich and turned up at the bull door next Thursday. Oh, I meant, why bother to bring him all the way here? Could it be your friend, Luca? I wonder if I might trouble the person in charge. Mm. Ah! Oliver Latham, I have a cottage here. Mm, yes, Mr. Latham, I was going to come and talk to you. Uh, I'm Madame Dalglish, this is Inspector... I understand you're engaged in the grisly business of sifting through the clues and alibis, and unfortunately I have to go to Ipswich mm. to lecture the local drama circle. So, as a friend, or a former friend of the deceased, I thought I would volunteer whatever information you might require. Thank you. You were at the Bull Door the night he died. What? I don't see did what you often that... go there. Among others, why? Did you know that Mr. Seaton was there? Well, if he'd seen me coming, he would have left at once. I'm sorry, I have no idea of his movements. I was doing something for the telly. Which, as it happens, I saw. Oh, what did you think? One hates doing these things, but one's cleaning lady enjoys Where them. Where did the so. program end, Mr. Latham? Around 11, and then there were a few drinks, and, um... And not, I imagine, with the woman writer you criticised. Oh, certainly, and she thanked me. Writers these days know how to manipulate publicity to their own advantage, Mr. Dalgleish. Far from horse-whipping the hostile critic. As Morris wanted to do when I reviewed his play. I didn't know he wrote plays. Oh, yes. One, if you can call it that. About Dorothy, their marriage, her suicide. He never spoke to me afterwards. <laughs> Despite Celia Calthrop's best efforts, all I said was... Well, what did you say? Well, all I said was that he should stick to writing thrillers and not regale the theatre-going public with the sordid details of his personal life. Sordid? Why do you say that? Oscar Wilde warned us against washing our clean linen in public, and he was invariably correct. So, after this uh, TV programme party, you went gambling? Yes, in order to relax and to meet a friend. Your name, sir? Well, thank you for that assumption, Inspector. My father gave me one useful piece of advice. He said, never go to bed with a woman if either of you would be embarrassed to admit it the following morning. I'll have to check with her first. I will need her name, sir, regardless of her feelings, if we are to verify your alibi. My alibi? Dorothy Seaton was beautiful. I'll show you in a minute. I've got a photograph through there. I hope you don't mind pins. Frightfully old-fashioned, I know. But at least we can pretend all this fruit is doing us good. Now, come along in, sit down and make yourself comfortable. Though we haven't got all day, it's Dricky's later at Celia's. Tell me about Mrs. Seaton. Well, Oliver was her lover, one of them. I suppose, being in the theatre, he was used to dealing with manic depressives. Poor Dorothy could cast a pall of gloom over any occasion. Sometimes I almost felt sorry for Morris. Almost. It hadn't been for Geoffrey. 
That's one of Silvey's portraits. Morris was so beastly to the poor boy that he refused to come and stay here anymore. Wanted me to sell up and go and live with him at Brighton. I've been here for years. I wasn't going to let a vindictive old scribbler like Morris Seaton drive me out. Why do you say vindictive? Oh, he was as famous for that as he was for his claustrophobia. He'd never come into a place like this. Ceilings are far too low. Mind you, suffering from asthma myself. Why do you call him vindictive, Dr. Bryce? Well, look what he did to Dorothy. She went off to Latuke while he was in London researching one of his boring books. Apparently, he wrote her a letter telling her exactly what he thought of her. Plunged her into instant gloom. She came chasing back here, God knows why. Probably seeking consolation from Oliver. Whatever it was, she didn't find it, because she walked into the sea. Left a note on her clothes and drowned herself. And what did Morris do? Turned it into a West End play, honestly. I don't often agree with Oliver, but on this occasion... Oh, here's the famous photograph. I took it. Sylvia developed and printed it. She's got her own dark room, you know, somewhere in her hovel. The lovely Dorothy, Morris, and Sylvia, looking as sour as ever. Of course, this was one of poor Morris's favourites. Yes, I always knew he had a taste for the garish. Oliver, you mustn't speak ill of the dead. I think he's getting at you, Aunt Celia. Who would ever contemplate such a thing? Where have you been? I've been recovering from the third degree, my dear. But I wouldn't let that stop me attending Morris's wake. He's not even buried yet. Why don't you go and get yourself a drink? Let me go. Elizabeth. I think that this is how Morris would like to have been remembered by his friends. Hymns on the lawn on an English summer evening. Come off it, Celia. You were the only one who could stand him. I'm getting Justin a drink. Can I get one for anyone else? I'll come and help you. Oh, Digby, we were just discussing what best to do with Seaton House. There's nothing to discuss. I'm not going to live there. I wouldn't be seen dead in the place. Can't wait to get rid of it. Don't you agree that would be unwise, Elizabeth? Yes. What's wrong with the house, Digby? I hate the place. Always have. Wouldn't it be the perfect place to bring your blushing bride? <laughs> I shall sell it as soon as I can. Sell it? But we've never discussed... Why should I discuss it with you? I think perhaps I'll leave you two to sort this one out. Digby, please don't be beastly. We've got so much to talk about. You may have been running Morris's life for years, but you're not going to run mine. But you're his official heir. Exactly. What's that supposed to mean? That what I say goes. All right? No, Digby, it's not all right. This is absurd. You're behaving like a spoiled brat. I shall behave exactly as I please. And the sooner you learn to live with that, the better. that Maurice Seaton gave him a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Thought it might be important. And I thought it might be quite nice to see you. You know that letter you brought yesterday? You know, the one from Seton to Max. It was dated last month. Can you recall any earlier conversation about the award? 
No, I'm sure there weren't any. I only heard about it a couple of days ago, and all I know is that when Morris thought up the literary prize idea, Max was going to administer it. Did Seaton know how Max felt about his work? You know, writers. They believe what they want to believe, make the rest up. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you something. If a body was found fully clothed, and lying in the bottom of a boat with the hands cut off, what would you think had happened? What, I think he'd been murdered. Hmm. But if the post-mortem discovered that Morris Seaton had died of natural causes, had died of a heart attack, and the hands had only been cut off after he died, what would you think then? Well, the obvious answer is that the fear of having his hands cut off caused the heart attack. Unless the pathologist made a mistake. Mm, he could have, but I doubt it. It's interesting, isn't it? If Seaton died of natural causes, then what crimes actually been committed? It's got to be a crime to mutilate a body, hasn't it? And surely it wouldn't matter whether he was alive or dead. <laughs> it's interesting. Do you think Digby Seaton knew about the letter? No. He couldn't have known his brother intended to change his will. Why not? Well, if his solicitor had no idea. Seaton typed the letter to Max himself. Surely have kept a copy. Well, we haven't come across it. Or maybe S Sylvia Kedge knew. I'll check again at the house, but even if she knew, there's no reason why she should tell Digby. Apparently, there's no love lost there. And he only found out he was the heir yesterday. Besides, he's got a perfect alibi. At the time of Seaton's death, Digby Seaton was in the cells of West End Sentinel, drunk and disorderly. He was let out in caution, but not till Tuesday morning. OK. Are you all right? Both of you? Excuse me. Miss Calthrop. Oh, Commander. I'm afraid I have some very serious news. Um, shall we go inside? Once she regains consciousness, we'll be able to tell more easily. And the X-rays show a minor fracture. And the question is, who will want to hurt her? Well, everyone loves Elizabeth. It looks as though the brakes were deliberately tampered with. How do you know it wasn't the garage? They're so careless these days. Uh, we're not sure. We are checking. Or perhaps she didn't remember to have the car regularly serviced. I mean, I try to ensure she has enough money. But young people of today, they just have no conception. Did anyone know she was going into Southwold? Well, Digby, I suppose. He stayed to supper last night. And he and Elizabeth are so fond of each other. I mean, he even went down on his knees to propose to her. Oh. Well, what was her response? Well, it was jocular. Could you be more precise? Well, she said he was only doing it to get his hands on Morris's money and... And? Well, the phrase she used was, I remember it exactly, she wanted someone whose IQ was bigger than their shoe size. <laughs> Digby thought that was quite funny. In fact, he roared with laughter and gave her a big hug. At least he was more demonstrative than poor Morris. Why do you say that? Well, Morris could only talk about two things, his work and Dorothy. Never mind the misery she made of his life. After she'd gone, he remembered only her beauty, her charm, her gaiety. Excuse me, sir. I just been down to get the papers. Who else could have done it in that time? I told you I was fast asleep. The only time you're fast asleep is in the theatre. 
Do you think I'm at all interested in your pathetic little collection? No. The only thing you're interested in is yourself gambling and girls. Dr. Bryce. Uh, Mr. Latham, can I have a word with you in a minute? Yes. Thank you. This way, is it? death of that boring fat toad accusing me every time something goes wrong in his pathetic little life. Uh, we'll check your alibi out too. There's still a few questions I need to ask him. He should have set up home in Brighton with that scrawny chorus boy he found so attractive. Even he tired of his bleating. Now all he does is just sit there, sipping cheap gin, writing historical tracts which nobody reads. I want forensic at Dr. Bryce as soon as you can. Thank you. Would you like some coffee? Is it instant? Yes, I'm afraid it is. Good, that's all I drink. Uh, Tony, did you recognize the axe as belonging to Dr. Bryce? Yes, but I didn't impale it in his precious table. Uh, no, I'm sure he didn't. Any more than I used it to cut off Morris's hands. Tell me about the £19,000 that was transferred to your account over a period of eight months. Payments transferred from the personal account of Dorothy Seaton. I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Latham, your finances have been checked all the way back to your Oxford days. Generally, there's hardly been a week when you were not in debt. There's even a mess bill from Balliol that's been outstanding for 25 years. How do you know all this? It is my job. Thank you. Tell me about Dorothy Seaton. Why did she pay you such large amounts? She loved me. She used to visit me out of loneliness, for comfort. Living with Morris was like living in a refrigerator, she always said, perpetually cold and with no light. I see. Of course, she was unstable, but I never dreamed she'd take her own life. That bastard Morris drove her to her. Well, that still doesn't explain the 19,000. Dorothy gave me money because she wanted to, because I needed it, and because it gave her pleasure. Did you love her? She was the only redeeming feature in this miserable community. Celia always saw herself as the leader, but it was Dorothy who kept us together. Since her death, the whole place is falling apart. Did her husband know about the money? Eventually, and there was the inevitable unseemly scuffle. Dorothy helped me out when I ran into debt and never asked to be repaid. Money was of no importance to her. She was rich. She was happy to spend it. According to our investigations, bankruptcy proceedings have been started against you. Yet your declared expenditure never seems to exceed your income. How is it that you got into such financial troubles? That is none of your business. People who get into this sort of debt do so usually for two reasons. Either they're being blackmailed, or they're financing a habit which they can't afford. I'm not going to say any more. If you wish to charge me or whatever, please do so. Otherwise, I'm going. Mr. Latham, you're, you're free to leave whenever you like. Now, before you start bullying me any further, let me give you some advice. If you really want to know who killed Morris Seaton, why don't you concentrate on who might gain from his death?
Well, it was Dr. Bryce's axe. <laughs> he may be vicious on the subject of Morris Seaton, but I can't see him chopping off his hands. It sounds like a red herring to me. Some buggers trying to make a fool of us. Well, Dr. Bryce and Oliver Latham certainly loathed each other. Well, you think Latham used the axe? Mm. It's possible. Uh, is Digby Seaton in there? You won't get much out of him. He's about as much use as a fart in a windsaw. Oh, Mr. Breen was wondering how you're doing with Luger in London. She's all right, isn't she? Yes, yeah, she is. All this interrogation, fingerprinting. Anyone think we were serial killers? It's hardly an interrogation. You volunteered a statement. You had no objection to being fingerprinted. Now, you said you had no idea that your brother intended changing his will. I told you, we weren't even close. Well, well close enough to put him in touch with Mr. Luca. Morris asked me. It was the least I could do, after he bailed me out once or twice. Talk about getting blood from a stone. My God, the lectures he gave me on reforming my entire character. Did his request surprise you? Mm. <laughs> Everything about Morris surprised me. How could such a nondescript man marry such a beauty? How could a man with the soul of a civil servant write in such gory detail about murder? And how could such crap sell so many copies? Why do you think he chose the Bulldog? Supposedly the best. And I work there. I did until the bastard fired me. Well, why was that? I asked for a share of the money I was making. I was a shill, you know, playing shemmy for the club. Excuse me, Sylvia doesn't come in on Sundays. Hello? No. No. Look, not now. Is there anything else you want to know? Only I've got an appointment in Southwold. Uh, you knew Miss Marley was going in there this morning. Did I? Well, according to her aunt, you talked about it last night at dinner. Dear Commander, I only stay there to entertain those two silly women. Because Celia's cooking is marginally better than Sylvia's. <laughs> we talked all sorts of nonsense. If Liz said she was going to Southwold to shop. Do you really think it's the sort of riveting information I'd retain after a night of cheap plonk? <laughs> Do you remember asking her to marry you? Oh, that was a joke. I don't mean Celia took it seriously. It... You were turned down. Not for the first time. Liz made a joke of it too. Of course, by the terms of your brother's will, you wouldn't inherit unless you marry. You don't need to worry about me. I'm sorry. Morning, Commander. What can I do for you? Well, maybe you can help us, Miss Kedge. I've, um, I wanted two questions. Oh, excuse me. Oh, my wife, she's, uh, she's, she's gone out, she's taken our key. I wonder, would you mind letting me into my room? Um, Is that all right? Well, I think it'd be all right. Oh, thank you very much. It's the suite.
I didn't know you were back. How long did you work for Mr. Seaton? Oh, it seems like forever. So you knew everything about him? Yes. When did he first think of the idea of creating a literary award? What? His publisher showed me a letter stating that in the event of his death, his estate should be used to create a literary award. Well, didn't you know anything about it? No. So, you never saw this letter about uh, creating a literary fund? I did everything for Mr. Seaton, and it's the first I've heard of it. If he'd wanted to have kept it a secret... From me? Why should he? I stood neither to gain nor lose. No, I, I meant from Digby. Mr. Seaton knew he could trust me with anything confidential. If he did intend to cut poor Digby out, I'm sure he would have told me about it. Mm. His brother must have been surprised to have inherited the lion's share. Mr. Seaton cared deeply about his family. Digby was his only living relative, his only hope of keeping the family name going. Until he thought of the prize. Well, I'm sure he intended to tell me about it. It's Digby's good luck, really, isn't it? And that was a risk, Charles. I had no choice. Yes, I think our friends will hold their fire if I can personally guarantee this. Have the police got them? No, the police don't have them at Ipswich. They've got to be in Maurice Seaton's place somewhere. Mm. How about Digby? Yes, I'm seeing Digby. I shall persuade him. Never fear. Well, I'm, all I'm saying is just one possible method, that's all. Why not just knock them on the head? Well, if they wanted it to look like a heart attack, natural causes. I still don't see why they bothered to drive them all the way down here. Well, we're no more when we're sure of the means. Let's say the body was carried down this path and put in the boat there. You must really chop off the hands and uh, set it adrift and get rid of the vehicle. You don't think they just carried the body in the boot? Here we are. Seven vans registered as being abandoned. Well, none of them are much good because of the time scale. But this one, no. Van abandoned in Ipswich. London plates. Last known owner, Mr. Driscoll of Cardiff. Take a look. We might get lucky. And let's have this area of the marsh by the village dragged. How would I know if he was taking photographs? But even if he did... Digby, Digby, this is very important to our client's peace of mind. We are talking about people you would not wish to upset, do you understand me? You fired me, remember? Oh, dear. Oh, Digby. Digby. 
You will go to your brother's house, you will find those photographs, and you will bring them to me here. Now, is that clear enough for you? I don't have to do what you say. I'm rich enough to start my own club. Oh, no, Digby. Want... Digby. Digby, oh. we don't have much time. And if you don't succeed, you won't be able to start a pram race. You can get stuffed. Can you push it up from the bottom, Andy? I asked him about it last night. Didn't say anything. Just shook his head. And you're absolutely sure it was Digby? Positive. I'd spent Monday in London with a friend. You might tell Aunt Celia. No. And I went to King's Cross with him to see him onto the midnight sleeper. Digby was coming out of the station bar. sometimes, but Dick is not murderous. Tell me, why did you give him a lift into Ipswich yesterday? Couldn't he have taken a taxi? Didn't know he was going to be a millionaire then, did he, Commander? Hmm. And his car was in dock. Actually, I didn't mind. Aunt Celia can be awfully tiring sometimes. Are you up to seeing her this evening? If I must. I mean, I could tell you you're not well enough. No, no. She doesn't see me that often. She'll be able to do all the talking. Why didn't you call? I really just heard. Are you all right? Well, I'm all right. My bloody proofs. It'll take me hours. Does this happen often? Douglas. Uh, right, sir. Uh, right? Yes, she is, thank you. It's right, miss. Picked up a fridge in the sluice. Holes punched in it. What? You wanna see it? Oh, well, I can't, can I? You know what the situation is. We'll get it to forensic. I could pick you up and take you to Ipswich. Oh, God. Um, well, hang on a minute, will you? Go on. I'm a big girl. Don't worry. I need you to come and get me. This stupid taxis won't take me. So? I'm feeling terrible. I've done all I'm going to do for you. You're on your own now. What do you mean? 
You've got to, Sylvia. You owe me. I owe you nothing. Yes, you do. No, Digby. If you don't come and get me, that's it. The end. Everything. Understand? Bitch! details of that high tide alert. The recent heavy rain and the forecast of northeasterly gales means that tides are expected to reach danger levels on tomorrow's spring tide. Sandbags are being distributed to high risk areas in case of flooding. There are also... Must have been somebody who knew you was there. Or someone taking a chance. Hmm. Are you alright then? Tell me about that freezer. That's with forensic now. Should know pretty quickly. We're very lucky to pick it up before this weather breaks. Sorry. These are only preliminary findings, uh -huh. but apparently the threads found in the freezer match those of Morris Seaton's shirt. Well, what about the blood samples? The same. And on the axe. You were right about the van, too. There had been an attempt to clean it, but we found two good prints on the door sill. Digby Seaton's. Right, let's pick him up. the idea? I've no idea. Dr. Bryce, I suppose. Maurice Seaton was claustrophobic. Dr. Bryce, ceiling called for a boat, don't you? How would you kill a man who had a weak heart and make it look natural? Put him in a box, make his worst fears come true. Give it air hole so he doesn't suffocate, just die of fright. Which gives Digby Seaton time to have himself taken into custody. Provide the perfect alibi. He wasn't there. But why remove the hands? I don't know. But for Morris Seaton, the ordeal must have been terrifying. Judging by the amount of blood, he probably tore his hands to pieces trying to get out. Douglas. to talk to the pathologist. Uh, won't you let me get someone to take it back? Can't I wait for you? I don't know how long you're going to be. Please.
long as he'd been dead. Only about two hours. When can I have first findings? Well, it's obviously poison. I'll try and do the PM first thing if I can. I think? Yeah, I should be right. Let's organise a search as soon as we can. We have a poison room, Mr. Nolan's habits. Discovered that Digby killed his brother, he turns him dead. Mind you, it does pose the question. Are you okay? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a waste. Oh. Would you like something else? No. No, thank you. I'm not hungry. Do you want to leave? Yes, I think I'd better. No, you stay and finish. It's not just the gate leg table. I didn't touch your bloody gate leg table. Even if I could afford to lend you money, which I can't. Just a small amount, just to pacify them. Otherwise, do you know what they'll do to me? Fortunately, I don't share your expensive passions. Why don't you sell your car? How would I get about? Ordinary mortals manage. You thought of asking Digby. He's just come into a fortune. I can't find him. Or Sylvia. I wouldn't have thought Sylvia could afford to lend anything to anybody. Are you all right? No, you're not, are you? For years, I thought I was the problem. But I'm not, am I? Well, looked at objectively, I... I want to be subjective. I'm in the middle of an inquiry. Oh, you're always in the middle of an inquiry. Oh, come off it. When you're putting together an important deal, you never take time off a My personal problem. My problem? No, I said personal. I can't put myself into compartments the way you do. If a problem comes up that demands a solution, I don't put it aside until work's over. I try to recognise what's urgent and give it my attention. I can do more than two things at once. Everyone can. Well, not necessarily well. That doesn't matter. It's making the attempt that counts. Oh, I suppose everybody thinks they can change the person they love. It depends on whether they want to be changed. nothing to me. Either you commit yourself or... Well, why do you think I came up here? I can't sit about waiting forever. You've got to make a decision. You either want me or you don't. We've known each other for years and I want to live with you. I know you love me and I'm sorry but that's just not enough anymore. Go on fighting for both of us, Adam. I expect you're right, Miss Ma'am. I wonder if I might have a word. But can I come in? Yes. What is it? Well, I believe you knew Mr. Digby Seaton. 
rather well. I'd like to know when you last saw him. Um... Uh... I can't remember why. We're just trying to establish his movements over the last 24 hours. Why? What's happened? Well, I'm afraid he's dead, ma'am. I'm sorry to say, we think there's been murders. No, um, just tell Maitland. Lucas should be isolated. I mean, he's out on bail now, so just let him run. Once he realises he's got nowhere else to go, he might become more cooperative. You know, you really ought to have a proper breakfast. I promise you, I'm fine, Aunt Celia. I never have breakfast in college. To build up your strength. Hello? Oh, hello, Sylvia. What? What do you mean? What? Yes, I have Elizabeth here with me. No, I'll tell her. No, 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 you tell them. Goodbye. What's happened? Poor dear girl. What is it, Aunt Celia? When you're so weak. Not that week. Tell me. It's Digby, that unfortunate boy. Oh, is it the police? They wouldn't say, but I'm sure they think he cut my brake pipe. He's, he's dead, Elizabeth. Poisoned by his own hip flask. When do you think you'll be back? I don't know. Soon. I'll call. There's no doubt about that. You still think they're connected? Yes, I believe so. To Luca? Yes, I think Maurice Seaton was lured to King's Cross by his brother. He was knocked on the head and shoved into a deep freeze where he died. On what evidence? Hmm? Not that I doubt you're right, you understand, but uh, since you are presenting the case... Well, Maurice went to King's Cross from the Bull Door. Digby was seen there by two people just before midnight. His prints were on the van that was stolen in London and dumped in Ipswich. And on the axe? Uh, no, that was wiped clean. So, Digby put the freezer in the van and drove it from London. On the Tuesday, having been released from West End Central, where he established his alibi for the time of death. I still don't understand why he didn't just leave the body in King's Cross. <laughs> Nor do I. Any more than I understand his motive. I had an old super who used to say it's one of four things. Love, lust, loathing, or Luca. When it comes to families, I go for money every time. I thought we were dealing with one killer. Well, in a sense, I still think we are. There's not sort of pattern emerging. Well, you can make a pattern fit anything. True. But assuming that Digby killed his brother, we still don't have a motive. Yes, but what if someone was using him? Someone who wanted Maurice Seaton dead? Well, Luca would be interested in those notes and photographs. 
When are we getting? Today. Of course, if it isn't, Luca, it's got to be someone from here. Someone from Moxman. But why bring the body up here? Why cut the hands off? I have to, Max. There's no real choice. There's always a choice. Oh, Max, let's cut the crap. I love New York. You're not going to give me all that nonsense about the buzz. New York and London are virtually identical. Bankrupt, violent, full of rubbish, potholes and unfortunates. It's the writers, Max. Europe's a place to be, if you believe that old curse of living in exciting times. Can you think of a single English author who could name more than two European writers, let alone read them? Adam. Oh, whenever I think I'm getting near him, he seems to retreat. Yes, but could you live with him for the rest of your life? Given the chance. Well, after all this time, I think he's forgotten how to commit. Well, he tries, but there's always a sigh of relief when I go back to my place. So, what are you going to do? I don't know. And now, attention all shipping. The meteorological office has just issued the following gale warning at 1417 BST. Time and Doggan, northeasterly, gale force 8 imminent. Humber, Thames and Dover, northeasterly, severe gale force 9, increasing to storm force 10 imminent. And that is the end of the gale warning. If this doesn't let up, we'll be floating out of here. At least these help us with Luca. But if he wanted to kill Digby, I don't think he'd have used poison. So it's closer to home. It's Oliver. Huh? I think he's dead. He's lying on his floor in the dark. I noticed the window of his car was open. I tried to shut him, but the door was locked. I went up to tell him. Oh. Uh. What happened? 
and lose your footing, fall down the stairs. Did I what? No, that insane bloody woman. Who's that, sir? She should be put away. So a bloody kid. Ah! Oh. Oh. I saw Digby on the beach last Tuesday. And when you discovered Morris's body, I put two and two together. Why didn't you tell us? You told Digby, though, didn't you? Yes, I did. Why? What were you hoping to gain from it? What are you talking about? Was it money? Were you hoping to blackmail him? How dare you? Mr. Lytham, remember, we do know your financial situation. Have you any sugar? Mr. Lytham, why do you think Sylvia Cage attacked you? I don't think. I know. I arrived back in my car. She was on the doorstep, waiting. She looked agitated. I asked her in. I closed the door, and she attacked me. And why would she do that? Well, she was trying to cover her tracks, wasn't she? Cover her tracks? Well, Digby must have told her before he died that I'd seen him. And why would that affect her? There are times, Inspector, when you are extraordinarily dense. They were married six weeks ago. Sylvia Cage married Digby Seaton? Yes. Digby? Digby. My God. Sylvia thought she'd killed me. Those crutches are lethal. I suppose after you've murdered three Seatons, another death doesn't make much difference. Three Seatons? Well, she murdered Dorothy, didn't she? She murdered Mr. Seaton? Well, she sent that letter of Morris's, the one where he told her what he thought of her. He didn't intend her to see it. At least, that's what came out of his dreadful play. Sylvia had other ideas, and then she got her husband to bump off Morris. And where is she now? How the hell would I know? Tell me more about Digby. You think she murdered him? Well, of course. By poisoning that harmless sock, she finishes up with everything, doesn't she? How do you know that, sir? Well, who else would bother? Oh, Darren! 
Why did you kill Digby? Didn't he stick to the bargain you made when you married him? Digby was a fool. If he just left Morris in the boat as we planned, no one would have known. <laughs> We'd usually ban it. And he saw the state of his hands. He cut them off. Exactly. He couldn't resist sending them to the man he'd sacked. He couldn't resist flirting with Elizabeth and then sabotaging her car when he thought she might tell you about King's Cross. Worst of all, he was foolish enough to treat me like Morris did. As if I had no feelings.
Alexa. You met the Nationals again? Commissioner says, well done. That weather must have been terrible. I told you not to go up there. Where's the report on Luca? There, on the desk, sir. Ah, good. We've uh, picked up the couriers here, and Interpol reports another two in Germany, three in Monaco, and another one in Switzerland. But after what uh, happened to Luca yesterday, we'll have a tough time getting anything out of them. I see. Where's Luca now? Paddington. Safe cell. He can't be got out. Good. Are there any messages? Yeah. Uh, oh, from... No, sir. Oh, let me introduce Inspector Reckless without him. Commander, this is Jeff from the garage. I'm sending you a list of spares we've ordered for you. It's as we discussed, and the cost will be just the same. Delivery is about two weeks. If you've got any queries when you see it, give me a ring. Goodbye. Mr. Dalgleish, this is Mike Jevons. We've good news on your leaseholder freehold situation. Most of the problems have been resolved, and if you'd like to call us back, we'll explain further. be back. I don't like doing this over a machine. By the time you get this message, I'll be in New York. And there's no point in ringing Max because I've told him not to give you my number. I'm sorry, darling. I'd, I just don't know what you want from me. I'll be in touch sometime. Bye.